cancer, the C word. Chances are it has touched your life in one way or another. I know it has mine. But what if there was a way you could take control back? If you could own your own cancer? I'm Mike Tucker, and we're here to help you create your best life possible. This is Lifestyle Magazine with your hosts, Dr. Sharmini Long, Obi OBDK, Lionel LaMountain, and Mike and Gail Tucker. Joining us today is patient advocate Dr. Peter Edelstein, who encourages cancer patients to take charge of their health and own their cancer so they can remain in control of this confusing and frightening process. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Dr. Edelstein. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. So when you say to own your own diagnosis, what do you mean by that? Well, as I practice medicine, I would often see patients who became really passive in their own care. Whatever the doctors or therapists said, go ahead and do it. Not, not even just cancer, but a number of, of illnesses. And at other times, I'd see patients who really weren't willing to give up their independence and autonomy. Mm -hmm. You know, they had owned all these other aspects of their life, mm -hmm. raising their kids, picking their careers. And sometimes those people would say, well, wait a minute, I wanna, I wanna understand mm -hmm. more about my disease and, and play a role in this, and I want my wife or my husband to. And I really felt those folks did better. Maybe not even medically, but in terms of their quality of life. And so what I mean when I talk about own your cancer, and again, you can expand it to own your diabetes, own your heart disease, right. is I think it's important for people to remain um, in control. It doesn't mean you have to understand everything about your health, but these are decisions that affect you and your spouse and your kids. And you, you really should think twice before handing over important decisions to people who, who don't really know you. Th this thing about control, this is, this is huge for patients, isn't it? I mean, this can make a huge difference in their attitude about life and even in their dealing with the disease. I, I absolutely agree with that. I think learning just the basics of your disease, and for many people they don't understand, you don't have to learn everything there is to know about cancer yeah. or, or heart disease, but understanding the basics and the fact that you know what your goals are in your life for yourself mm -hmm. and your loved ones, that should really allow you to play a role in all of the decisions about your care. But, you know, culturally, a lot of people, particularly, I think, older right. patients, say, you know, I'm not going to question the doctor, and he or she's always right. So you have to overcome those cultural barriers, the things that you've been brought up to believe, which is this is up to them to take care of mm -hmm. you. One of the most basic steps, I think, um, in that process is just finding the right physician that you are comfortable with. What steps do you recommend for patients to find the right cancer doctor? Well, I, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. And I, and I talk to patients about this and I write about this. I say, isn't it fascinating that you came to me as a surgeon simply because your primary care physician, who sees you for 15 minutes mm -hmm. a year, said you should go see Dr. Edelstein. I said, you know, you pick your babysitters with way right. more <laughs> care than you pick your, your cancer surgeon. Um, so it is critical to think about finding what I call the right physician partner. Right. Mm -hmm. This should not be someone who tells you what to do. This should be someone who is a fit for your personality and engages you as a partner. And when you're talking about cancer, uh, you're talking about diabetes, heart disease, these are long-term illnesses. Mm -hmm. So you really want to find the, the, the people who are a fit for you. Right. And, and no one knows what that fit is better than you do. When you're talking about cancer specifically, I try to help people understand there's a big difference between picking the right surgeon versus picking the right oncologist. Right. A surgeon like me is likely going to be involved with you for a very brief period of mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And unlike chemotherapy or radiation where you can be in your community hospital and get the same care you'd get at a great institution, mm -hmm. your surgeon is really a technician. Yeah. So whether I'm at a great institution or your local hospital, if I'm not experienced with your specific stage and type of cancer, I'm probably not the right person for you. So you do have to do a bit of research and you have to ask the right questions. Right. Well, that's interesting. In your book, you talk about the cancer machine. Is that really just speaking of the, the whole health industry and, and how it's set up? It just doesn't make it easy for you to own your own cancer? Yeah, I think that's particularly true of cancer. 
You know, we have this population that's aging very rapidly, mm -hmm. and physicians are getting busier and busier, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we less have and less, less and less time. time. And people hear these, what I think are three of the most frightening words in, in the English language, you have cancer. Yeah. Yeah. And suddenly it's, this is too much for me to understand, yeah. I have all these fears, you take care of me. And the cancer machine to me, it's not intentional, it's not evil. It's just a simpler way for things to work. It's really easier for us to have a patient who doesn't ask many questions, mm -hmm. <laughs> doesn't do a lot of research, just, just goes along, say. right? <laughs> because we're trying to get through our day and help as many right. patients as we can. But when that happens, um, you see things that aren't right. I mean, I talk to patients all the time about their disease and, and where they're going, and, and I, I ask them to challenge, well, why? Why are you going with that physician? Do you know if that physician has experience in that right. very uncommon cancer? And they go, oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So you just kind of flow into this machine, which is all too willing to accept you and, and mm -hmm. put you through. Yeah. Can you give us an example of a patient that you've seen and how the concept of owning your cancer has changed their experience? Sure, I can, I can actually share with you um, uh, a discussion I had, two discussions I had just in the last week, and I think this also emphasizes the point, it's not just about the patient. They really need their loved ones deeply involved. A friend of a friend of a friend, you know, the old story. Mm -hmm. Someone called, and, and, and she was a young woman, and she said, I, I'm sorry to waste your time. I said, you're not wasting my time. She said, my mother lives on the other coast, and she's been diagnosed with a cancer, and I'm far away, and I'm worried she's not getting the right care. And I said, well, let me learn a little more. Tell me a little more. The woman had a cancer in, a, in part of her intestine called the duodenum, and it's a type of cancer I'm sure you're familiar with called an ampullary carcinoma. These are not very common. And she said she was being cared for by first the general surgeon in her community hospital, and she wasn't sure that was okay. And I said, well, here, here's some advice. It might be okay. Here's some advice. First of all, I would actually go online to that specific doctor's website or the hospital's website. Most physicians have their interests and their experience listed on their websites. Mm -hmm. I said, if this doctor doesn't appear to be particularly focused in these types of cancers, I'd call and ask, and I'd, mm -hmm. I'd literally ask. You can do this respectfully. Right. I said, because this is an uncommon kind of cancer where we know that doing this operation infrequently has poor outcomes. Uh -huh. Now that opposed to, let me give you an example of breast cancer. Right. Virtually all general surgeons do quite a bit of, of operating on women with breast cancer and are very skilled. This is an uncommon cancer. Yeah. And in the end, she determined that this surgeon had rarely done this, yeah. mm. and she was near a major medical center, and we got her hooked up with someone who was an expert in the field. Exactly. And I told her how proud I was. She had made the phone calls. Yeah. She had overcome those you know, mm -hmm. cultural training of not mm -hmm. challenging yeah. her doctor, and her, her mother was in a better place. Well, it does sound like you've empowered her, and that, yes. that's a good thing. Uh, we're out of time right now, but you're going to join us in our next segment, and we will be right back after this. Stay with us. There's more Lifestyle Magazine coming up. The truth is in here. Discoveronline.org. Hey, how's it going? Sir, are you okay? What? All oh, this? It's probably nothing. I'm sure it'll go away. Go away? But, sir, that can't be good. No, it's cool, really. Do you want a napkin or something? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this, so why ignore the signs of a stroke? At the first warning signs, call 911 immediately, because time lost is brain lost.
secrets out. Get the keys to longevity and a better quality of life from your friends at the Seventh-day Adventist Church by visiting www.healthylifeinfo.com. We're back with Dr. Peter Edelstein, who is talking about how cancer patients can put themselves in the driver's seat. And welcome to the crew. Thank you. Glad Thank to be here with the team. You, you yeah. bet. Yeah, it's, it's a team. Yeah. We'll be easy on you. Thank you. Appreciate it. In your uh, first segment, you were talking about owning your own cancer, which I love, by the way, putting the patient kind of in the driver's seat. Let's say we have a viewer that was just diagnosed with stage two or three cancer. What would you say, and you kind of started addressing it over, the, over there, what would be the first two or three steps they'd need to take, you'd suggest right now, for them to really own this process, if you were to spell it out? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. The first thing that I say, and it's not applicable to every situation is, is take a breath. Mm -hmm. There are indeed a few cancers that are very rapid in, in their mm -hmm. growth, mm -hmm. and there certainly are people who come in with very advanced cancers, or they have a cancer that's bleeding or causing pain, and, and mm -hmm. those people can't take a breath. They have to get yeah. care right yeah. away. Mm -hmm. But the majority of cancers are not really fast growing. That's encouraging. And so you want to take a breath like you would with any other critical decision or pathway in your life. So I say, first of all, take a breath, sit with your spouse, mm -hmm. and, and just get yourself together and make a plan. The plan has to start with picking the right physicians, and we touched upon that a little, doing a bit of research. It's sort of unfair. The burden falls to the cancer patient mm -hmm. and the family yes. to do all the work, but yes. you know, sure. welcome to the real world. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, try to find um, a physician who has experience in your type of cancer, and you made a great point, and your stage of cancer. Mm -hmm. There are many physicians who are comfortable with early stage cancers, but if you're a patient who has a more advanced stage mm -hmm. cancer, you probably want to find mm -hmm. someone who has experience with advanced stage. That's really so great right. advice. Understand, you know, who's the right fit for you mm -hmm. personally and also who has experience with your exact type of cancer mm -hmm. and your general stage of cancer. Is it common for doctors for a for doctors to mis misdiagnose? Does that happen often and would you say that's rare? Well, unfortunately, there was a big study published just in the last couple months, I'm sure you're familiar with, that said about 12 million Americans a year, so one in 20 who sees their outpatient doctor, have an error in diagnosis wow. or a misdiagnosis. Wow. Wow. Now, let's be fair, not all of those are cancers, yeah. but these weren't trivial things, and some of them were cancers. So the truth is, Physicians are only human. Yeah. We are under increasing time pressure. Mm -hmm. We're under increasing financial yeah. pressure. Mm -hmm. And no doctor goes to work to say, hey, today I hope I miss something. <laughs> sure. In fact, of course. we really, so, but if you see a physician for some unusual bleeding or some pain, and you're with your physician, and what they're saying they want to do or not do mm -hmm. isn't sitting right with you, mm -hmm. you have to develop some confidence yeah and respectfully say, you know, it sounds like you just want to watch us. I'm really not comfortable with that. And, and I think you'll agree. I love that. 95% of physicians will say, okay, let, let's think about this. Mm -hmm. That 5% who say, well, that's what I want to do, find another yeah. doctor. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> right. What about the whole second opinion thing? Sometimes we think that's disloyal to our physician right. or we're insulting our physician. You are exactly right. I, I have a, a colleague um, a non-physician colleague whose wife has very advanced recurrent breast cancer, mm. very uh, aggressive, mm. a mean mm. cancer, mm. and they're being treated in a small town where we live. And I said, you know, we live uh, near a city that has a major cancer institute. Mm -hmm. What did they say? And he said, well, I didn't want to upset my doctor. Oh. No. And I said, yeah. you know, with due respect, my friend, yeah. this is your wife's life your and life. his ego. Mm. Yeah. And again, right. most physicians yeah. will say, Yes, yeah, seek a second pain. Please. Now, at the same time, for co more common cancers, earlier stage cancers, mm -hmm. if you have confidence that your physician knows what they're doing, and Go often that's the case, there is no reason mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you have a more advanced yes. cancer or a recurrent cancer, a rare yes. one, get a second opinion. Second, okay. second opinion Good never advice. hurts. Mm -hmm. never I find hurts. that um, there's more talk among patients now about alternative treatments. Can you talk to us a little bit about alternative or supplemental cancer treatments, how to tell the difference and what you recommend? Yeah. In this this is a great question and you're exactly right. You know, I write about the gentleman who came to me 
with a very advanced rectal cancer, in fact, mm -hmm. incurable. Mm -hmm. It had been diagnosed at a point when it was curable. Very rational, logical guy, but of course, when you hear you have cancer, yeah. suddenly mm -hmm. logic goes out yeah. the door. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want the surgery, which would leave him with what we call a colostomy, mm -hmm. a bag. So he searched around till he found someone who said, I can cure this with wheatgrass juice and some yeah. nutrition. Really? All good. And of course, by the time he was <laughs> drained of his money, yes. yeah. Yeah. he had an advanced cancer. Yeah. And so people said, well, you know, what foreign country did he he go to for this treatment? I said, Cleveland. Cleveland. Yeah. So well, that is a foreign country. That said, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen in Cleveland. <laughs> There's <laughs> <a> good people. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't mean to pick on Cleveland, but, but the point is, you know, these are not scammers who are distant. Yeah. Right. Yet at the same time, we've learned that nutrition is very mm -hmm. helpful. Sure. There are studies that show acupuncture can help with cancer-related nausea. There are a lot of wow. things we used to roll our eyes at. Mm -hmm. I have some general guidelines. Okay. Say, first of all, if you can pick something that doesn't interfere with your treatment, it can't postpone your chemotherapy, mm -hmm. it can't mean you don't get radiation mm -hmm. therapy, it can't put you at risk of infection from your surgery. Mm -hmm. So as long as it doesn't interfere with your therapy, I accept that. Mm -hmm. As long as it doesn't break the bank, mm -hmm. okay? Because the worst thing I've seen is a couple cases like this where the patient did purely alternative therapy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm double mortgage their house and then left their spouse after they passed away with debt, which no one yeah. wants to do. No. So think about this shouldn't interfere with what you're, you're getting from your Western medicine and it shouldn't break the bank. But then if it makes you feel better and potentially can make you better, God bless you. That's, right. Good that, that's supplemental. Uh, we, we're out of time here. We're going to have to break. But thank you so much for thank helping you. us with it. Up next, we'll talk with a cancer patient that outlasted his doctor's mortality prediction by seven years and counting. We'll be right back. Stay tuned for more Lifestyle Magazine. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved me so much that he sent down to earth his boy. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. His one and only son, and this is why, so that no one needed to be destroyed. The Heavenly Father loved the human race so very much that he gave his one and only son. That he gave his one and only son. God loves the world so much that he gave us his son, Jesus. That anyone who believes in him will not die. We're not gonna die. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. Everlasting life. Eternal life. And anyone who believes in him will live forever. And that's a long time. Beautiful, no matter how you say it. For more on John 316 and other texts, go to myfavoritetext.com. In 2007, Eric Kahlberg was given three to five months to live. Seven years later, he's sitting with us to talk about his journey. Eric, we are very happy that you're sitting here with us to talk about your journey. Thank I you. am too. Thank, Thank you, you for, for having being me. Here. Thank you. Eric, this is uh, one of those situations that this cancer, you hear that, that label, that term, and I think it really frightens most men. And uh, you've gone through it. And I'm just curious, you know, what was your story leading up to that? And then I, I just have to know, when you heard the diagnosis, what did you feel when those words came out of your doctor's mouth? All right, um, it was, it was um, as you'd expect, shocking. I was fairly young, 33 years old, oh. um, so. Um, and it usually plagues younger men. I'm yeah, it, it's not too uncommon, testicular cancer in under 
you know, between 30 and 40 years of age. Uh, I was very um, shocked, but I, I didn't, it didn't really sink in for a while thinking I am young, that, you know, I'm gonna beat this thing. It'll so, be okay. Yeah, I, it didn't really um, hit me hard until I was um, laying in a bed a few months later after surgeries and chemotherapy and then the doctor had said, um, trying to um, coach me on how to live my last three to five months wow. and what to enjoy and maybe to not think so much about some um, seeking out like weird treatments or something. Oh, really? What did, what did you do after he told you that though? I mean, you've just been told you have three to five months to live. Uh, I would have that, become depressed. I would have checked out completely. Yeah, no, no, no. I, right at that moment when he walked out of the room, I cried and I cried yeah. and cried. Sure. And, um, you know, of course, uh, being a father of two young daughters um, and husband to my wife, um, my thoughts go right to them. Oh. And Absolutely. Yeah, you know, just thinking that they, they are going to have this... Uh, emptiness inside yes. um, after I'm gone. gone and I think there's a lot of guilt that I felt. Guilt. Um, Why guilt? Um, because I would be the cause oh. of their pain and go, the, the process of being treated I would feel then also that any kind of pressure or um, pain that they had was going to be caused because wow. of my sickness. So it was gonna be a, a tough road. Well, that's really tough because, you know, you feel guilty and yet you don't have any control over this none, thing. I had none at all. But so, what we did have control over though was um, finding out what, you know, what we could do after this is at City of Hope um, and being left with no hope. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, we kind of just yeah. uh, needed to figure out what to do next. Yeah, so what did you do? Uh, through somebody at our, our church had recommended we see a Tibetan doctor. Mm. Um, we went to see her in November of 2007, about um, five months after my original diagnosis. And um, from that point, seeing her uh, changing my diet drastically, um, taking herbs um, and um, other supplements, in yeah. addition to still seeking wondering. out okay. um, with my oncologist, a, a different oncologist than I had originally had, oh, I but seeking out um, other clinical trials um, or, or whatever he could offer me. I was just uh, doing a combination of both. Yeah. And that makes so much sense, really. You know, continue with regular treatments, yes. but find everything else you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in, in my situation, I have really a lot to live for. Mm -hmm. And I think to, you know, not to look at every alternative is is really a disservice to my family. Absolutely. Did your family uh, instill within you a sense of hopefulness? Because that had to make a difference. Well, You're I, here I, seven years later. Oh, definitely. De especially my wife. I would say um, <sighs> denial is um, maybe uh, a quality that she had, or or that I was able to. I can understand that. I yeah, relate to that. <laughs> you know, and I think that her hopefulness made it. Um, a lot easier to to get through things where I would never think about um, a few weeks down the road and, and she was or I, I couldn't right. think about what would be happening a month or two months or especially a year from now because I'm not going to be here but yeah. um, in the way she would speak it was as if I you would, I would be still here. be there and That's we need awesome. a plan for what we're going to do. Was there a point at which there was a shift in your thinking? Uh, yeah, you know, actually, after we saw the Tibetan doctor, I was pretty spent. My body, I just finished um, some pretty rough chemotherapy, and I just had a, a lung surgery, and it was very depressing. But once we saw her, and um, it might sound kind of silly, but, you know, she's telling me she's doing her diagnosis and telling me that she feels a strong life force. Yes. Mm. <clears throat> and um, I think that is when things started to change and I started to feel like we could actually not necessarily beat it but um, a great chance survive, yeah. survive. For, for and you actually did yeah that's tremendous I'm sorry Seven our and time and a half years is later. so short but we thank you for being here and we'll be back with a few final thoughts after this stay tuned we'll be right back some secrets are meant to be kept, 
Some are meant to be shared. But the secrets that matter most are the secrets of the kingdom. Somewhere. Secrets of the Kingdom will take your children on an audio quest they will want to experience again and again. Your children will follow their guide Silversong as he takes them on a journey to a most special place called the Kingdom to meet someone who loves them very much. This wholesome story of faith, prayer, hope, and love is dramatically created with narration, dialogue, sound effects, and songs. Secrets of the Kingdom is available on CD or cassette for $9.95 plus shipping. Just call our toll-free number, 888-940-0062. That's 888-940-0062. And ask for Secrets of the Kingdom on CD or cassette. Secrets of the Kingdom. Let the adventure begin today. Secrets out. Get the keys to longevity and a better quality of life from your friends at the Seventh Day Adventist Church by visiting www.healthylifeinfo.com. We're back. We've had a wonderful conversation about cancer and owning your own cancer, owning your own diagnosis. So what is the takeaway from this, guys? Well, I think for me, just listening to Eric, it's learning that there is hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, you know, even if you've got that three-month diagnosis, mm -hmm. yeah. it may Absolutely. not come true. Sure. Right. There's sure. always hope. Yeah. yeah, I really found it helpful with Dr. Edelstein because I had someone really, really close to me who's been going through the cancer process. And this whole idea of a second opinion that disloyalty element you brought mm -hmm. up has mm -hmm. been huge. And to hear him say, hey, most of your physicians, they don't mind. They would like mm -hmm. you to go get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was huge to me, <clears throat> that, to have that permission and approval. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that even more so, if your physician doesn't want you to have mm -hmm. a second opinion, that's a huge sign that you need to get a second yeah. opinion Absolutely. and find it. It's a red physician. flag. Yeah. Yeah. It's Use a your real resources and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. To it's it's your life. Yeah. It's your life. Or your loved one's life. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Thank you, guys. We want to thank uh, Eric Kahlberg and uh, Dr. Edelstein for being a part of this one. Check out Dr. Edelstein's book, Own Your Cancer. Thanks for you being a part of this one as well. We look forward to seeing you again. But until then, you take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching Lifestyle Magazine. Visit us online at lifestyle.org, where you can watch more programs and get more information on our guests. To get a copy of today's offer, call 888-940-0062 or go to lifestyle.org. That's 888-940-0062 or lifestyle.org.